get rid of those yoga mats and quit messing with healing crystals and we come against the dream catchers and every form of Wiccan every form of wizards and magic and new age and all crystal balls just right now just begin to say it the Bible says we expel demons you know how we expel them just take a couple of good deep breaths. I'm going to talk to that spirit of witchcraft. In the name of Jesus, I come against every foul spirit of witchcraft in every theater, in every place that this is being viewed right now. Every spirit of witchcraft, up and out, manifest and go. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We come against every curse of tarot card readings, up and out, in the name of Jesus. Quite the theatrical display from Greg Locke, who is now apparently a demon slayer. Greg was doing what's called a mass deliverance after his movie was shown. And tragically, I did similar theatrics in the New Age where I was teaching and writing about this process similar to what Greg Locke is doing. It, in the New Age, it's called casting out earthbound spirits. This was, of course, before I was saved, before I studied the Bible and went to seminary. And as you can see from these screenshots from my old heretical books, please don't buy them. If you have them, burn them. And these New Age books that were manuals to me that where I learned about spiritual releasement, The Unquiet Dead and Spirit Releasement, they teach the exact same methods that Greg Locke is using, but they don't call themselves Christian. But Sadly, many new Christians, especially ex-New Agers, sadly end up getting involved with discernment ministries like Greg Locke's. Now, let's just clarify right off the bat. We know that spiritual warfare is real. We know that demons exist and are real. We know that sin has consequences, including spiritual warfare. We have all studied the Bible. The Bible warns us in Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So the question isn't whether Christians can be oppressed by demons, because of course, yes, they can. The question is how the Bible tells us to deal with spiritual warfare. Are we to follow the Bible's exhortations to put on the armor of God and submit to God and resist the devil? Or are we to try to cast out demons ourselves, twisting Jesus's words out of context, including Luke 9, verses 49 to 50, to try to make ourselves front and center in having dramatic and spiritually dangerous shouting matches directly with demons. Are these so-called demon slayers like Greg Locke mimicking Buffy the vampire slayer? And are we to use the phrase in Jesus' name like a magical incantation to cast out demons? The question is, what does the Bible say? The other question that people are grappling with today is whether Christians can be possessed by demons. Well, we're here to tell you, the Bible tells you, that they can't. Once the Holy Spirit indwells a person upon salvation, demons cannot inhabit that person. Demons can only oppress and harass believers. And this is where the Bible tells us how to deal with such spiritual warfare. This is a topic that my guests and I have discussed in other videos that are linked in the video description below. My guests today are theologian and author Dave Jenkins the executive director of Servants of Grace, and also Don Hill, who's a Christian blogger and author. Don was saved out of the New Apostolic Reformation, where she was an NAR prophetess before God graciously opened her eyes to his biblical truth about prophets. And that's a topic that she now helps others with. The links to their websites, their social media, are in the video description below. Thank you so much, Dave and Don, for being with us today. Dave, can you please give us some background on Greg Locke? Yeah, yeah. So the Baptist News reports, and we'll put a we'll put a little screenshot of that for you on this 92. Then he went on to receive a bachelor's degree in biblical studies from Ambassadors College in 1998 and a, a master's degree in 
Revival History from the Baptist School of New England in 2000. Both schools are uh, fundamentalist, uh, independent KJV, uh, dispensational, uh, complementarian. After spending 10 years as a Baptist evangelist, Locke started a Global Vision Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. So now we're going to play a, a movie clip of that. Now the movie is called Come Out of Jesus' Name. We're not following after the signs. The signs are following after the truth. And revival is coming back to truth, biblical truth. There's nothing more biblical than setting people free from the influence of demonic activity. Deliverance leads to reformation. Reformation leads to revival. You can't fight something that you don't know is there. The first deliverance Jesus did was not in a nightclub. It was in a synagogue. The first time the demon manifested, it happened right in the church. I commit every spirit of depression. It's happening in the streets, even if it's not happening in the church. Greg Locke is known for critiquing his opponents. It's really important that you hear and that you see the way in which he engages because as we're going to talk about in this episode uh, this is vital to his ministry he is very um and and this is as nicely as i can say it he is really overtly almost militantly aggressive in his the way in which he responds to people so we're going to play those clips and then um, i got a few thoughts that i'm going to give to you after that Say to every preacher out there right now that's watching this or will watch this later, all the YouTube heresy hunters, I say the God of Israel rebukes you for your lack of faith. The God of Israel, the blood testifies against you. If you do not get in the word of God, if you do not theologically line up with what the Bible says, I pray God shuts your church down. I pray that he gets you out of the ministry. I pray everybody sees you for the false shepherd that you are. I get it. I get it. If maybe you've been misled, if maybe denominationally you have to take off some lenses, but if you can clearly see what the Bible says and then still deny the reality of the fact that the Holy Spirit, through the name of Jesus, can still set people free from demonic influences, you, my friend, are a heretic. You are a cult leader. So I have I have two more clips that we're going to play. Here's one more clip uh, for you. Who did you get the most resistance from when it comes to deliverance? That's an interesting question. I was just talking to my wife uh, in the bed last night before we went to sleep. I said, it's, it's interesting to me that now that the movie's out, my greatest critics, y'all's greatest critics, mm -hmm. the greatest critics of deliverance ministry, the ministry of Jesus, and especially this movie come out in Jesus name. It's not been witches Now they hate it, right? It's not been witches, Satanists, LGBT or atheists. It's been Calvinists. It's been the reform community. They are the most, critically biased, demeaning people on the planet right now about this movie, the, the reform crowd. And I, I find that interesting, but look, I say, you know, to that demonic doctrine of Calvinism come out in Jesus name, right? I've got some reformed friends, but they have been the most scathing of anybody. They've been worse than the witches. They've been worse than the, than the gay community. And that's, that's sad to have to say that because look, I mean, they're calling us false brethren, false mm -hmm. prophets, you know, fake shepherds, the whole deal. And I'm like, you realize this is the ministry of Jesus? You realize mm -hmm. this is the third of what Jesus did? Mm -hmm. And all we're doing is being like Jesus. So stop wearing shirts that ask the question, what would Jesus do? And read a Bible and start doing what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Because what Jesus did was cast out evil spirits. There is nothing more gospel central than seeing people set free. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why they don't get it. And I know that's a that's a hard way to answer that. But really, the Reformed community... And, and some Baptists, we've brought a lot of Baptists over, right? Mm -hmm. But the reform community has been just absolutely inviscerating us about That's this. It. Here's one last clip of him giving uh, some more criticism that will give even more of an explanation of, of what, what he says. Now, you said that in theaters, there was the the live streaming of you actually praying deliverance or or. Uh, what, would, what would you consider that? Just praying deliverance or is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we did a full blown, you know, mass deliverance service, just like I would on a Sunday night, but I didn't have yeah. two hours. I had, you know, 28 minutes. And so I had yeah. to really fine tune, you know, heaviness, fear, you know, pharmacia, addiction, witchcraft, especially mm -hmm. everybody flares up on witchcraft. We've all got some kind of witchcraft, new age nonsense in our, mm -hmm. in our hocus pocus background somewhere. Right. So that's what most people flare up on. That's kind of the, 
the framework. And then I deal with, you know, religious spirits. There really is a religious spirit. And there, that's yeah. the reason why people deny the reality of deliverance ministry. They got some kind of denominational hierarchy, some kind of stronghold, some kind of demonic mm-hmm. doctrine, because most of us were taught against this. And so like me, once you break off that spirit of religion, that nonsense comes out of you and comes off of you and you break that curse, yeah. you start seeing things in a whole new level. And so, yeah, I just got up and just went live and boom, it just, I'm in an empty tent, right? I'm mm-hmm. in an empty 3,000 seat tent, except for like four or five people in there and camera folks. And I'm in a tent and the tent's empty and I'm doing the largest mass deliverance in church history <laughs> you know, with people all over America. So I'm in my mind while I'm talking to a camera, I'm having to formulate the idea. This is happening right now. So what yeah. do I say next? When do I pause? When do I mash the gas? And I had, you know, 30 minutes, 28 minutes to pull it off, really 26 because I gave the gospel sure. and, a, you know, a salvation testimony first. So it was unprecedented. And so I, I don't know what round two, round through, round 10 looks like. Mm-hmm. I just know I'm excited for what the Lord's doing. And like Vlad said in the movie, I'm excited for the sheer embarrassment that the devil is having right now. He's scrambling. Mm-hmm. He's scrambling. Amen. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So now you have a good idea of how Greg responds to critics. And I want to say something about that. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, Paul says, uh, speaking of an elder and the qualifications, that one of the things that they're to do is to be gentle. And as you're listening to those clips, uh, ask yourself a question. Is that how you have ever seen a pastor respond to criticism? Because I can tell you that no biblically qualified pastor would ever respond to that. And we're now now we're not even just talking about a biblically qualified Christian. Uh, qualified elder. What I'm going to say is, is that in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, we're told to correct opponents with gentleness. Elders are to be the model, the example to the people of God. They are to live above reproach. That's what Paul says, Titus. Ask yourself a question. To be above reproach, it doesn't mean to be sinless. It means this is the standard that God has set. And ask yourself, Do you want to be under a pastor who responds to people in the way that Greg Locke does? The answer is no. That says something. It says that we should question when we hear Greg Locke saying, open the Bible. Okay, so we'll open the Bible. We just looked at 1 Timothy 3. We just looked at Titus uh, 1. We, 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 I quoted from uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, one of the fruits of the Spirit, those things that the Holy Spirit are producing in our lives in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, one of those fruits is the is gentleness. What about what about patience? You know, now he he also critiques Calvinism. He says that this is a doctrine of demons in a mocking, condescending way. I just say, I just say to to Greg, I say to those who follow him, prove it. And I'm not just saying, oh, state it. There's a difference between stating something and proving it. Make the argument, make the case. Because stating it in a mocking, condescending tone, it violates the spirit and it violates the intention of Ephesians 4.15, which is to speak the truth in love. It is, you may think that you are speaking the truth, but the command is not the imperative there, is not just to, to tell the truth, it's to do it in love. By the way, at the very heart of the fruits of the Spirit, those things that the Spirit are producing in our lives is love. How you say that you're concerned uh, clearly for people, great. Uh, We're concerned about you being biblically qualified. You say that we're we're not telling the truth and that we need to open our Bibles. But when we open our Bible to Ephesians 6, even, we see that we're united to Christ by faith in his name. And so we we learn in the Old Testament that the Lord is our warrior in Isaiah, which is the backdrop for which Paul uses in Ephesians 6. So what? where's the argument? Make the argument. Make the case. Uh, don't make, don't be mocking and ridiculing. The Proverbs have a lot to say about mocking uh, somebody. We're not to engage in that. There's no, no Bible verse that gives you warrant to speak about or uh, or to address another Christian in the way in which you did. Thank you. That's very powerful. And there are other things in Greg Locke's life that would make it questionable that he would call himself or or his new wife that she would call herself a 
pastor, but we'll get into that later. One of the passages that Greg Locke and other deliverance ministries use as their proof text that we are qualified to cast out demons ourselves is in Luke 9, 49 through 50. And this is when the Apostle John said to Jesus, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And so that can seem to say that you don't have to be an actual apostle to be authorized by Jesus to cast out demons. And they, of course, throw in the verse, greater things than these can you do, as as kind of a, the extra <laughs> icing on the cake to that proof text in their minds. So I talked to Pastor Jim Osman about this. Uh, he's the author of Truth or Territory, which is one of the best biblical commentaries available uh, on spiritual warfares. And this is what Pastor Osman told me when I asked whether Luke 9, 49 through 50 is applicable to modern believers casting out demons. He said, first, far too little information is given here to construct a doctrine that would apply to all people for all times. Second, let's stipulate that Jesus did give that person the ability to cast out demons. What does that prove? It proves that during the life of Jesus, he gave authority over demons to more than just the 12. That's no surprise. He did the same in the case of commissioning the 70 that he sent out in the very next chapter, Luke 10, verses 1 through 17, and see especially Luke 10, 17. The concern that John raises and Jesus' answer to that could well have been Jesus' preparation of his disciples for the sending of the 70. Though Jesus gave authority over demons to some who were not in the 12 during his lifetime does not prove that deliverance ministries, that exorcisms are for today. We still have no instructions to the church to do exorcisms, no examples of ordinary Christians being involved in such actions, nor are there commands to perform exorcisms, nor are exorcisms ever recommended or prescribed. We still see that they were regarded throughout scripture as miraculous signs and classed with healings and resurrections. All that Luke 9 shows is that during the life of Jesus, there were some who were given that power who were not among the 12. Jim Osmond says his response to this argument is, so what? If someone wants to suggest that all Christians today have the power to do exorcisms, then they should also have the power to heal the sick and raise the dead. So let's go. Let's take that authority into the mortuaries and hospitals and make things happen. To approach the issue from another angle, we have clear teaching on the nature of exorcisms, miraculous work. We have no instructions to Christians to do them. This is the overwhelming and consistent teaching of the New Testament. Why should I allow one reference of one incident during the time of Jesus, his earthly ministry, that has very little information provided to overrule the clear teaching elsewhere. At best, Luke 9 is a very unclear passage. We don't know who this man was or why Jesus gave him authority. Likely, he was one who would later be included in the 70. There are more than a few unanswerable questions in this passage, and it is dangerous and ill-advised to build doctrine on it. And then I also asked Pastor Ron Hensel of the Midwest Christian Outreach, who was talking about this topic. Uh, he said that Matthew 7 21 through 23 is a passage arguing against modern believers engaging in deliverance. And this is where, of course, the famous passage, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You can see the whole passage on the screen right now. In addition to these biblical parameters, why would we want to go head to head with demons who are cold-hearted, merciless liars and manipulators? What makes us think that we or some deliverance minister can outsmart a demon with a formulaic prayer? This is along the same type of thinking that we can burn some dried sage and smudge away negativity. This is one of the many reasons why we need Jesus. When Jesus walked on the earth, the demons were amongst the first to recognize that he is the son of God. The demons trembled at the sight of Jesus. Why would we not pray for Jesus to cast out the demons instead of trying to do it ourselves or pay some deliverance ministry to try to cast out the demons? Don't we just trust our sovereign triune God to deliver us from evil according to his will? And I just want to say that that's Calvinism right there from the, the 35,000 foot level is it's all about God's sovereignty. It's trusting in God and God's promises to protect us, to protect believers. That's Calvinism. And that's why Calvinists speak out against deliverance ministries 
which want to make it more about me-centered. And I also want to say that I was a part of deliverance ministries, both before I was saved and after, and they are dangerous. You're going to have demons who are angry that you're trying to cast them out. They don't know who you are. They're going to fight back. It makes things worse, is my point. And very often it's very expensive and time consuming. Why not follow what the Bible says and put on the armor of God? That means Bible study. That means being in God's word. Why not submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee as the apostle James told us. God told us through James. Why are we trying to do these things that aren't even in the Bible? So in in theology, we theology nerds, we use the word normative to describe the way in which God normally works throughout redemptive history, that is throughout the history of the Bible, which is the history of of how God has worked uh, among his people, redeemed through the blood of Christ and through the resurrection of, of, you know, Christ. And, you know, that, you nowhere, nowhere in the Bible do you see these activities being normal. They are a miraculous a sign, a sign that points not to somebody, but to a person and to specifically the person of Christ and to his work. And so the, the other question that you have to ask about this, I think, as we've talked about many times on when as we've talked about these things is if that's the case and the Bible makes that clear. Then really the, the, the argument that, that you heard earlier from Greg Locke that somehow these things are normative. And so they are then an imperative for the Christian to engage in. That argument really falls flat. In fact, in that clip, one of the clips that I played for you where Greg goes on to, you know, talk about these things, he, 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 he mentions even more things about how we have a Calvinist and Reformed people have a religious spirit. I'm just, I'm just thinking, I'm pretty sure when I've read The Institutes of Christian Religion by John Calvin, as I've read many times, I have the completed works of John Owen. I've read them, Owen, for many years. They talk about the opposite. They talk about John Calvin is known as the theologian of the Holy Spirit. John Owen is known as the prince of theologians. John Owen wrote one of the definitive treatments on the Holy Spirit. It is a massive tome. If you want to go full on nerd, uh, you can go to town on that. And but but the point is, is none of these people want to deal with these men in the case of Owen and Calvin and 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 so many others. They don't want to deal with it, but they they sure like to state whatever they want to say. Um, and they say it, as we're going to see with with great zeal, with great gusto. Um, but they have no argument. They have no scripture attached to it. They just say, this is what scripture says. They, that's so true. And they say a religious spirit, which is not even in the Bible. And then Greg Locke in his handbook has a whole list of things that he casts out, like the Leviathan spirit, which doesn't exist. And so many of them talk about the Jezebel spirit and the spirit of this and the spirit of that. They just make these things up. Uh, Don, I know you have a lot of experience as well w- with this particular type of ministry. Can you tell us a bit about that? I have. Uh, I was part of a ministry that did deliverance ministry. This, what I've seen as, as I've come out of this movement, this is even more extreme than what I had seen. Uh, things happen, but I'd seen drop cloths laid down, buckets brought in for people to throw up in, and I know that there was a clip you played about him focusing on the breathing that he was he was doing the mass deliverance, the alleged mass deliverance at the end of the movie, and that's a big thing they focus on too. A deliverance ministry is they'll say, well, demons come in through for, through a breath because it's a spirit, so you need to breathe it out, cough it out. What I what I find interesting um, in listening to these clips and just thinking back on some things, and then hearing the demonization of of your your opposition is is a straw man, um, and it, it's not it, it's denying any sort of theological discussion for one thing from an opposing view. So it's the easiest argument, the easiest rebuttal is just to attack your opponent with ad hominem attacks and to shut them down and say, well, they have a religious spirit. Well, that's not mature for one thing. That's not spiritually mature to do that. And you're not wanting to have a theological discussion about it. And coming from someone who was in it and had it had experience, like, what are you going to do with me? What are you going to do with other people that were in it that had experiences that can say, 
I never got free. There's a problem here. It, a, a logical um, question is, and my husband and I were talking about this uh, the other day. Um, what if, you know, they may not like this because um, they like to call us the religious spirits. They're saying this, but what if they're the ones that are operating under demonic influence? And what if the people that are there are not even born again? They really do have demons, but this is all a demonic performance. I mean, that's an honest question to ask. How many of these people are truly getting set free? Are they repeat offenders? Because if they're repeat offenders, we've got a problem here. These people don't understand the gospel. Have they even heard the gospel? And he's even, it sounds like Greg Locke is even equating the gospel to deliverance ministry, to casting out demons. That's not the gospel. Paul would disagree with him. The apostles would disagree with him. They preached Christ and him crucified. They did not say, oh, by the way, dear Christian, you in Ephesus and in Corinth and in Colossae and in, and, and in Rome, you also have to have deliverance maintenance done because you may have demons hiding in rooms in your body. And that was the thing with, with Pagani. I mean, I've read Pagani's book. I reviewed his book. Um, Greg Locke has admitted in on more than one occasion in interviews that I've listened to, he has acknowledged the fact that there were a few people that influenced him in his conversion over to deliverance ministry. And Alexander Pagani was one of those men. And if you look at Greg Locke's deliverance manual, you can see that Pagani influenced him because in this book, The Secrets to Deliverance, Pagani talks about this teaching that he brings to to the the church is what he's saying because he believes himself to be an apostle even though he says he's not a apostle of Christ but that's you know that's another topic but he he brings this teaching with authority and saying this is new revelation that needs to be brought and that he is actually following the footsteps of Ezekiel because his whole premise of this book the secrets of deliverance which is pertinent to Greg Locke's belief is that he believes that demons can hide in body parts and that they can hide in areas of your soul because they have adopted this triune being, which is part of the word of faith teaching. <laughs> um, and you can believe in a tripart being and not be word of faith, but I'm just making a point of saying that is one of the elements of the word of faith teaching. And I believe that's how they get around this whole thing of saying, well, you can be born again, but you can still have um, a demon in your body or in your soul as a born again believer. Um, but Pagani talks in this book about he bases it on Jesus saying uh, what he did about his body being the temple. And so Pagani's argument is every time Jesus acknowledges his body as the temple, those go those are hand in hand. And he deduces that because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and based on the um Solomon's building of the temple and the three levels and um, the winding staircase, for example, there's a part in here he talks about different things that he puts together, it seems like, eisegetically to come to this conclusion that um, demons can hide here. He talks about, for one thing, the, the narrow recessed windows on page 27. So that Solomon also made narrow recessed windows Throughout the temple in 1 Kings 6 4, this created more potential entry points for demons that had to be guarded. Where does it say that in scripture? He's, he's adding to the text. He's he's reading something into the text that's not even there to bring his new revelation of this. Um, he talks about the three floors of the temple on page 30. And then on page 32, he, he mentions about Noah's Ark before he goes to this winding staircase in the temple. And he says, if something as holy as Noah's Ark had something unclean living in it, and yet the Ark was still able to fulfill its purpose, we have further evidence that Christians can have demons oppressing them. What? That has nothing to do <laughs> with deliverance. And then when the winding staircase, this was a wild thing that he even said here. He goes a step further with this deliverance teaching, and he talks about the winding staircase that's said to be in the uh, the temple. And it said stairways are like bridges that allow people and demons to go from one level to another. He says what's also interesting is that winding stairs look a lot like DNA's double helix. Could it be that DNA within, within the human body forms bridges and connectors that allow demons to transfer down the bloodline from one generation to the next and one, from one floor to the next? Where is the freedom in this? Because people are always get what's what's going to happen is people are always going to be looking for demons rather than dealing with sin and sanctification in their life and realizing that you still have a sinful nature that you deal with. You are not perfected as a born again believer. 
You're not. You're not perfected. You are both sinner and saint at the same time. The, the, the difference between us and the world is that we have hope. We've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture, according to Ephesians 4. We have, we have the promise of eternal life. We have been told how to wage war on the devil. And it's also important to remind other believers, whenever Scriptures are mentioned, it looks like the battle is from without for the believer, not from within. When, you know, I've heard Greg Locke quote 1 John 4, 4. He did that on the mass deliverance, said, you know, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And he he totally didn't even pay attention to what he just said, <laughs> because if the greater one in you, who's the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world, and that was addressed to Christians, then then we have no discussion here about casting demons out of born again believers. And even with uh, Pagani, the things that he he states in here about people needing demons cast out of body parts. And then he's saying it could be in your DNA. I mean, this is a never ending thing. So so what is the point of being a born again believer then? What hope do I have if I have to worry about demons entering my bloodline, entering my DNA, entering a body part? How is that? And how? where's the biblical discipleship for these people? Exactly. I think that they, these people, they need to be hearing the gospel first and foremost, because I, and I know, I know this is a difficult thing to say, and I don't mean anything in a, in a disparaging, malicious way of saying this, but I would dare say that many of these people are not born again. They've not heard the true gospel. They've heard something. This is another gospel that's being presented to them when they're hearing. You need demons cast out of you all the time. Right. It's, it, there's no freedom in that. Yeah. And here's a, a screenshot of a Baptist pastor who went to see this movie. And at the end, there was an offer that you could uh, put your phone up to a QR code and get involved with some sort of regular maintenance deliverance. So mm-hmm. one, one time is not enough, apparently. And no, and a lot of these deliverance ministers teach that you have to do deliverance minutes, uh, maintenance every couple months. That's crazy. This And so much of this, Don, as you're talking, is identical to what we were teaching and believing in the New Age, because it's all the same author, isn't it? It's all yep. coming from the devil who wants to distract us from the gospel, who wants to take our eyes off of Jesus on the cross and put it on ourselves. And, and, and in addition, so we didn't call them demons in the new age. We called them earthbound spirits. We thought they were deceased people who were very materialistic. So they were earthbound and they wanted to continue their life. So they'd be in the bodies of people and they'd be in the toes and the organs and everything you were saying. And then we called on Archangel Michael and Jesus to suction them out, to vacuum them out of your body, all the way to your toes and tips of your fingers. And and this was a big thing called spirit releasement work. That's There's this book, here's a screenshot of the, the book, Don't Get It, It's Heretical. And this is a man who quotes the Celestine Prophecy authors. So this is not Christian. And this other book, The Unquiet Dead by Edith Fiore, who's a psychiatrist who, I used to be crazy for this book. I would sell it at my workshops. I, quoted it all the time. She said that all these psychiatric illnesses, you know, she quotes all these different illnesses come from spirits and being inside of people. And she included depression and alcoholism, all the things that deliverance ministries are saying, but she's a new ager. She talks about, you can call not only on Jesus, but you can call on the Archangel Gabriel for help with Mm -hmm. all this. So my point is that this kind of method is not unique to even word of faith. It's new age and occultism. And it's this is really scary because a lot of new Christians get very attracted to the drama of this kind of deliverance ministry, the theatrics, because it seems so familiar, doesn't it? It seems familiar to those of us coming out of deception. There's also a false misconception um, when we say, when we, when we, are uh, coming against deliverance ministry. They immediately say, well, you're just denying that demons exist. I, I think we all three of us would agree that demons exist and Satan exists. That's not the argument. The argument is they believe that deliverance ministry is for born again believers. And I, there's just no scriptural evidence for that. The other thing too, is that you were talking about the experiences. And I think unfortunately what happens is because there is that adrenaline rush or psychosomatic thing that happens, and and above all, I think it's it's this experiential thing where someone, if they tangibly have something happen to them, then they can they can automatically conclude that it was real. And that's their proof to them 
that it was real. Well, it happened to me. I, I tangibly felt something. I threw up something. I coughed up something. I did something. And it negates your trust in Christ that of what He did. It's morphing into this works-based salvation of I've got to do something. If I don't do this, then I'll never be free. If I don't deliver myself, which is a oxymoron. You can't deliver yourself. There's even a self-deliverance thing out there that Jennifer LeClaire and other people teach. That's that's nonsense. You can't deliver yourself. That's making you God. It's this push and this focus of I've got to do something and I've got to feel something and you can't take that away from me because it was real. Well, there's people in the New Age that have real stuff that happen. There's Mormons that have stuff happen. There's all kinds of pe- atheists that have things happen that are real. But that's the fa- the foundation and the final authority is the scripture in the right context. And that has to be the final authority upon which we stand. Yeah, that's, I was never engaged in deliverance ministry of any kind. But as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, these people are being manipulated. They're being controlled. They're these people, I won't call them pastors, okay? I just won't. These people that are engaging in deliverance ministry, they are manipulating people and they are trying to control forces that nowhere in the Bible are we told that we have control over. And that's spiritual abuse, um, the definition of spiritual abuse. They are spiritually abusing people. And that is serious business. You know, the strongest words in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they're given to people who lead people away from the Lord. In Jeremiah 3.15, we see that that God desires to, to give us sh- pastors and shepherds after his own heart. And instead of that, you know, false shepherds lead people away from the Lord. And, and one of the classic marks of it is manipulation and, and controlling and, and using theology like a club to beat people over the head. Um, instead of lovingly coming alongside of them, with the truth, like Galatians 6 1 says, to bear each other's burdens and thus fill the law of Christ. Instead, it's, you know, club people over the head with the Bible in the name of Christ. And that's what Greg Locke does. He clubs people over the head in the name of Jesus. Or, as we're about to see with uh, Alexander uh, Pagani, we're, we're going to see him actually engaging in uh, literally what I'm talking about here with uh, abusing people, saying, if you, He's going to tell you, if you turn off your computer, then uh, you were interested in the rest of the conversation. So you have a demon. So let me play that now. All right. With that being said, for the rest of you, you probably saying, I don't have a demon. Well, you, we're going to find out whether you have one or not. And you're going to pray this prayer. Oh, don't back out now. No, no, no. Don't turn off the don't turn off the computer and don't turn off the smart television talking about oh, I'm going to log off now. Do not log off now. If you log off now, that's a demon because you were just fine enjoying the conversation. And now you want to log off. That's the devil Satan, I bind you right now in the name of Jesus, Messiah of Israel to stop them from logging off, turning off the TV or just walking away. I bind you now. You're going to leave them to pray this prayer and then not logging off in the name of Jesus. Why are they always talking about binding Satan? Where in the world do they get that idea? And Justin Peters is always saying this. Who's letting him be unbound? (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) I used to do that silly stuff too. It's embarrassing, but I think about the way that I prayed, um, which was not prayer. But I was really big into that of binding Satan. And it, it almost treats Satan like he's he's omnipresent, doesn't it? When he's not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how many people are binding Satan all over the world doing that? He's not omnipresent. When Jesus bound him, they were face to face. Um, the, he's a created being. He's not the antithesis of God. I engaged in that behavior for years. And I've repented of that because it, that's we don't have that type of authority. God mm-hmm. is the one that has the authority over Satan, even the angels. And Jude talks about the false teachers that would do this. And so does um, in Second Peter, the, the ones that would blaspheme the glorious ones, and that they will, they would, that not even the angels themselves would rebuke uh, other angels um, regarding Moses' burial in Jude, that the Michael archangel would not even rebuke Satan, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. We don't have that authority to do that. And that's dangerous to, to really engage dangerous. in practices. Yeah, it's really dangerous. It's insane, too, to think that we're going to have a one-on-one conversation, a shouting match with the embodiment of evil, the devil, 
I mean, who do we think we are? That's so narcissistic and prideful to think that we're going to win that just because we're using a magical incantation phrase in Jesus name or plead the blood. This is not biblical at all. And like you said, Don, it is so dangerous to get in a, a, a match with the demons like that. That's it, Call on Jesus. Jesus was the one who cast out demons in the Bible. Pray yeah. for God to cast them out. I mean, spiritual warfare, as we've been saying, is real. Demons are real. Christians mm-hmm. do get oppressed, not possessed, but oppressed. And Jesus is the one who will come to our rescue, not ourselves. Yep, I absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is all really uh, good. Now we want to show you even more evidence because maybe maybe you're not persuaded. Maybe you think, you know what? You know, all three of us are just making this up. But I'm telling you, we're not making this up. And what I said earlier about them engaging in manipulation, this is going to become so apparent over the next few minutes here as I play uh, first this uh, this first clip of Greg Locke. This first clip here will be Greg Locke engaging in deliverance. I renounce you, Satan, and all of your demons. I declare before God that you are my enemy. I'm now claiming deliverance from any and all evil spirits which may be in me or around me. Once and for all, I close the door in my life to all occult practices and I command all connected spirits to depart from me now in the name of Jesus. I renounce any and all addiction to drugs and alcohol. I repent for any substance legal or illegal that I have ever allowed to keep me bound I rebuke and call forth the spirit of pharmakia that spirit that keeps me in addiction and bondage I call you up and out tonight in the mighty name of Jesus so this is where you see the truth and lies mixed in which is what the devil's been doing since Genesis 3, it is important to repent for our sins. And so he does make a really good point that we've got to repent for being involved in all of these things. Um, But then he mixes in the lies that you can breathe these things out. As Don mentioned, that's a big uh, part of deliverance ministry that was also huge in new age and occult to breathe out any kind of negativity. Uh, That's not biblical at all. You know, I kind of wonder, I've had this thought before, but He's binding up a whole lot of demons there. Uh, I mean, he's covering a lot of t- territory. Why don't they just use this video repetitively to get people set free? Why do they need to keep making these videos? If this has enough power to close portals and to get rid of demons and to bind witchcraft and to get all the generational curses off, which Second Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. So you don't have to worry about all that you're you're made new in Christ. I mean, why don't they just take these this recording and just say, oh, well, you're dealing with a demon. Just watch this. You know, it, it just. I, I just want to say, notice the emphasis repeatedly over and over again. Notice the emphasis. The emphasis is never on preaching the gospel. The emphasis is on the demonic. Where do you see that in the gospels? Where do you see that? You, you, you Greg, you say, and I'm going to speak to Greg and his followers now. Where do you see that? You say you tell us to open the Bible. So we we open the Bible and we look at the Gospels, which I've read since I was five years old, by the way. I've never read that. So tell me where that is in the Gospels, Greg, or, or anybody. Tell me where that is in the Gospels, where Jesus emphasized uh, not preaching the Gospel, which, which he did over and over again, uh, but but your your emphasis is all about demons and Satan and casting people up. We don't see that in the ministry of Jesus, period. Um, you don't see that in the book of Acts. You, you see it, I think, once uh, with Paul. But you 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 don't see that as an emphasis. Instead, in fact, in a clip um, in in, an, in another teaching that he gave on uh, seven keys to deliverance. 
He he starts at Luke four. He doesn't even go into Luke four. He he goes all around, bounces all around in, in his explanation of things, but he never gets to Luke four. Had he just camp if he just camps in Luke four, well, Luke four is Jesus' first sermon. Jesus is setting the captives free. And he quotes from the he opens a scroll and un- unrolls it. And he's preached, Jesus is preaching in Luke 4 from Isaiah 61. What does Jesus say in, in Luke 4, his whole entire message? That he came to set the captives free. Where is that message in, in, in what we just listened to? Where is that message? It said it's this demon, that demon, this thing come out, this, then that. Where is that in the Gospels? And the answer is there's nothing. So everything that he just said, is what I what we call unauthorized speech from the pulpit. Uh, James three tells us. James three one tells us very clearly that teachers will be held to a stricter judgment. He's teaching in, in Ephesians four twenty nine. We're to, we're to speak words that edify, that encourage, that build one another up in the faith. Greg, do your words there uplift anybody? And the answer is no, because your words are not based on the truth of Scripture. If you're a professing Christian, Ephesians 4.15 tells you, commands you. It is an, in an imperative to speak the truth in love. There's nothing truthful and there's nothing loving about anything that j- we just listened to. Yeah, I found it really sad, Dave, when you mentioned that. I remember earlier on, he he made a point of saying, well, I shared the gospel for four minutes during that mass deliverance, but the last 26 minutes was focused on deliverance. So four minutes of the 30 minutes was devoted to the gospel. The rest of it was devoted to demonic deliverance, which is not the same deliverance. I mean, that's another argument that can be made that the same deliverance that they're saying is going on today does not match scripture because when they did it, when the apostles did it, when uh, Jesus did it, when those that were under the apostles that were given the ability to do that, it was immediate. It was not this hours long wrestling match of cuff, cough it up, give them the microphone. What demon are you? Talk to us. How did you get in there? How did you get, how did you get legal? There was none of that. So this is not the same as what's in scripture. It's we're, it's, we're in a better covenant. It shouldn't be like this. It, 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 we're, we have a better promise to us because of Christ. And I agree with you that the gospel is, is sufficient. Uh, Jesus is still delivering people today mm-hmm. through the preached gospel, through the word of Christ, through the, the, the call to repent and believe. He's still delivering people. He delivered me out of this movement. He's delivered you, Doreen. He's, I mean, he's still doing deliverance today. It's not this thing of we need demons cast out of us as born again believers. That's not, it's not the same as what's in scripture. That's such a good point. And Jesus, of course, rebuked repetitive prayer, which is yep. what they're doing. So this is unbiblical to be repetitive. And they keep pointing to, well, Jesus, uh, the, and the, he, he says a third of Jesus' earthly ministry was casting out demons. So therefore, we should be doing that. And if you don't do it, then you're not part of us. And and that's just such a slippery slope fallacy to be involved in. That doesn't mean ipso facto that we're... The, the Great Commission wasn't go forth and cast out demons. The Great Commission was to share the gospel and to make disciples, not to do this calling. And, and you know, when he says he calls forth these spirits, I don't know about you, Don, because you've been in the thick of this too, but I just recoil when he's calling forth these spirits. I thought, I think that is just so absolutely dangerous. And he's yeah. telling people to do that. You don't want to yeah. call demons. You want to, you shouldn't be doing that. Right. So the next clip that we'll be watching is Isaiah Saldivar, who is one of the uh, professing demon slayers. And he's going to be casting a demon of depression out at the movie theater. And this is after the showing of Come Out in Jesus' Name. So let's take a look at that. We have depression, we command that spirit out right now. Come out in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit must go. Every spirit of witchcraft must go right now in Jesus' name. Go! Come out! Come out! Come out! Come out! You have no power, Satan. Loose this body right now. Loose this body right now. Be delivered in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit out in Jesus' name. Go! Out of her mouth into the abyss. Come out! Out of her mouth into the abyss in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit, go! 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 In Jesus' name. Come out! Come out! You must go. Looser witchcraft. Looser witchcraft. 
Let her go. Come out. Come out. That's just horrifying. I think that would be amongst what you would call spiritual abuse, Dave, what you were talking about. And this, nice. this is, it's hypnosis too. You're hypnotizing people. You're putting that power suggestion. And this woman is laughing, which reminds me of that so-called holy laughter movement that was also so dem- demonic. And she's drooling. I mean, this is not the picture of someone coming to salvation through the gospel at all. No, no. I, I, I think that it really, when you're in that type of environment too, whether in this movie theater or in, you're in the services, I think there is a pressure there to submit to what's going on in there. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to make the man or, or woman of God look bad or look like they're wrong or anything. And there's a lot of theatrics, unfortunately, that goes into a, a lot of this deliverance ministry that's, it, it's abusive. I agree. It's abusive because you're you're denigrating that person and making a mockery of what true deliverance really is that comes through Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I question what kind of follow-up he would have. I mean, he's kind right. of a ce- celebrity now. And, and so she, now he's put it in her head that she's got these spirits of witches in her. And so she's going to go home after the movie and probably ruminate about that and worry about that and have anxiety and maybe depression. And then is, is Isaiah Saldivar going to go do follow-up care with her? I doubt it. Maybe for a price, but this is just, it's hypnotizing people. And like you said, the power of suggestion, if let's go along with this, let's not, she's just watched a movie with him in it bigger than life. And now he's in front of her. She's mm-hmm. going to, she's going to just cooperate with the script there. Yeah. Where, where's the real help for this person that is clearly probably looking for, you know, the help that only the gospel can give. And, and what this man is doing is not offering that hurting person any help. It's like, how dare he do that? How, how dare they just start saying whatever they want to say and whatever they want to do to these people that are hurting and struggling and they have real issues. So the the next clip that we're going to play is of uh, from Twitter of Greg Locke. He says that Democrats are God denying demons who can't come to his church. In fact, he tells them that they need to get out, get out, tells them to get out if they're a Democrat. I'm to the place right now. If you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. Well, as someone who was a Democrat for many years until there was a certain female politician that made me leave the Democratic Party, I became a Green Party. This is before I saved. and now. After reading the Bible many, many times, I have a biblical worldview. I'm not a left winger anymore. And so, you know, that's the thing is I can agree with the flavor of what he's saying, of that there's conservative values that are biblical worldview values. I get that. But it's the delivery and the out and out uh, just demonizing people who think differently than him. That's not sharing the gospel. That's not godly. I don't see the fruit there. And it's also equivocating that if you belong to a certain uh, political party, then you're not a believer. Again, that's not what defines you as a Christian. A Christian is marked by the their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Christ has done on the cross. And then from that, a believer will begin to have their mind renewed and transformed. And I agree with you, Doreen. I mean, I, I agree with his stance on things like abortion and things. I, I understand his zeal for those things, but he's making that equivalency again of Christian Democrat. That's not in scripture. And there are Republicans, I can remind him, there are Republicans that are pro-choice. There are Democrats that are pro-life. So that that argument doesn't even hold water um, as far as trying to make that um, that the classification of saying every if you're a Democrat, everyone thinks that. Of course I'm 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 conservative. So I get his zeal. I'm like, yeah, I get his zeal, but his delivery is awful and it, and it's abusive. It's absolutely abusive. Who, and so who in that church is going to feel comfortable coming and talking to their pastor about, about things like this and feel like they have liberty to come right. and talk about them and, and to have a, a civil discussion about them. And then, uh, you know, the other thing too, is I, I just think of, I'm not a, a church history buff. I know a little bit, but 
You know, I think about the first century church and how much they suffered under Nero. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't go around acting like that. They welcomed persecution and suffering because they knew that it was it was biblical, that it was promised to Christians um, and that their hope was in eternal life in Christ. And he he is (laughs) he is encouraging rebellious behavior. I mean, absolutely sinful, rebellious behavior. Yeah, he's talking about an insurrection. Yeah. And and so I'm just thinking about if I wanted to invite my neighbor who's unsaved and maybe a liberal at the moment, I couldn't invite them to that church. If I was to get up and to preach like that, um, the sound team in the back would turn off the, everything. That's what would happen. That That's what should have happened. Yeah. Um, nobody, nobody should have had to hear that entire rant. And, and I just go back again to Ephesians 4.15. To speak the truth in love. You are a professing a professing Christian, a professing Christian pastor. You want people to address you as Pastor Greg Log. You see that over and over again in interviews. First Timothy three and Titus one, and those are characteristics. Those are qualifications that are required of a pastor and an elder. Those are those are character qualities that you are to exemplify. Where is the gentleness in your delivery? Uh, where was the patience? There was no patience. Uh, where was where was any of the fruits of the spirit? There weren't any. Uh, where was the Second Timothy two twenty four and twenty five correcting your opponents with gentleness? Where was that? No, you went on such an an attack that. I, I have I, this is why I will not call him a pastor because in my mind he's not a biblically qualified pastor. Just the way in which he speaks to his opponents and like you're, like you were saying, Don, imagine being in his church and being under his preaching and you hear that and you're like, why would I ever want to go to him for counsel and care? Why why would I ever want him to be at the, beside me in the hospital when I'm having a surgery to pray for me and care for me? The answer is you wouldn't. Why would I want to take my questions and my cares and my burdens and my hurts and my fears? The, the overwhelming answer is you wouldn't. It's um, it's totally scripturally indefensible. Completely. And, you know, there's some articles, I'm sure you've read them too, that say that that Greg Locke became popular initially because of his rant video about Target opening up the women's bathrooms to men. Again, a view that we would agree on, but the way he did that. And so that's how he got popular was being this ultra right-wing ranter. And then the trajectory of being the ranter now seems to have shifted from politics to being the demon slayer. And it's all the same. It's all yelling. It's all the high uh, drama, all theatrical. I do know that the film itself was, it's a, it was made in four months and it was talking about how he, he made the, the, the change from being a cessationist to doing deliverance ministry. But um, I don't know. I, I, it, it's just, it's all very interesting to me. Like, and he talks about his platform, like his platform was developed because of uh, controversy. He says that in a trailer in the movie that his platform was built on controversy. Uh, I mean, but your ministry should be built on Christ, not controversy. So if your ministry is built on controversy and that's what you feed upon, your diet's off. Like that's, and 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 I agree with you, Dave, he's not a pastor. That's not, it's just not, he's not exemplifying. He's a bully is what it comes across. He's a, he's a bully and a pastor is not to be like that. Yeah, we talked last time about just and unjust criticism. And I mean, this is, this is, just criticism. We're we're putting evidence out there to show this is his behavior. This is how he behaves. This is how people that are in his circle in his camp behave. That's a just criticism. And bringing the Bible to bear on it because he says, "Open your Bible." Okay, we'll open our Bible, Greg. We did. Um, what we found is your ministry is not biblical. So we absolutely are all sinners, including after we're saved and myself included, before I was saved, I got divorced and I regret it. I've repented for it. God hates divorce. And so what we're about to say is uncomfortable for me with my past, but as Dave has been saying and emphasizing, the Bible says that a pastor 
is someone who's beyond approach. It also says that is the husband of one wife. And here's a screenshot of an article, and there's many on the web, so you can find this everywhere, of Greg Locke uh, leaving his wife for his wife's best friend, who was his secretary, his administrative assistant, and who he's now calling a pastor at his church. And she's calling herself Pastor Ty Locke. Let's take a look. Here, it has no power here. And we declare right now in the name of Jesus that that is broken. That is broken right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. So so that's Greg Locke's new wife, uh, calling herself Pastor Ty, doing deliverance work from the stage. And I don't know about you guys, but to me, that would be the number one red flag if I walked into a church and there was a woman on stage teaching and calling herself a pastor. Yeah, that's a another big thing that I used to believe was okay <laughs> in this movement. And then when I actually started reading scripture and noticing what the qualifications were to be an overseer of a church, an elder, I thought, oh, okay, well, that that's apparently not correct. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, that that's definitely a major red flag because women are not supposed to be in, a, in an authority like that in a church. So that that's very problematic. And, and of course, people are going to criticize you and me, Don, saying, but you guys are teaching on this video. And of course, there's no pulpit here. We're not right. serving communion. We're not not you know, taking an offering. <laughs> no, we're not baptizing people. We're nope. this is not a church. We could be. Is sharing the gospel. We can evangelize. We see that clearly with the woman at the well, one of the first mm-hmm. Gentile evangelists. And we can teach women theology. Yep. We can teach children, but yep. we cannot teach men. Right. And I don't consider myself an authority over anybody except my children. So I, I'm not in an authority and, I, and I'm submitted to my husband, who is the authority in my home um, with God as our ultimate authority. And um, realizing that when we when we belong to a local church, we are submitted to the pastor and have elders, which that was something I was not used to either. And in, in what I was involved in, there was no plurality of elders. There was an apostle. And so what he said went. Um, and that's not biblical. It, it's just a very different, very different dynamic. And I find personally, I mean, I was someone who was allowed. I was allowed. To minister on uh, on occasion on Sunday mornings at in the pulpit, I was I was allowed to minister to mixed congregations, and now I, I've repented of that and realized the error in that because that's not God's way. And um, I think that what we need to be content with, and I'm certainly content with it, is God's way, and God has developed His His uh, authority and His um, standard for that authority in His Word. He's he's established those boundaries, and I'm content with that. I don't I don't feel that I'm demeaned and I, I'm that I'm being beat down or I'm not able to do anything. Now, I recognize the order that God has established, and I want to obey that order because I'm His child and realize His ways are better. Yeah, God is not saying to women, "Hey," or to a man, "You're you're better." It has to do with Genesis 1 and 2. It has to do with design. Mm -hmm. It has to do with God made a man first, and he made the man to lead. And and if we read Genesis 3, it wasn't, yes, uh, Eve played a role, but the the blame isn't on Eve. The the blame is on Adam. And that's what Romans 5, 12 through 21 tells us. That's how we're sinners by nature and by choice. That's why David in Psalm 51, he recognizes that he was born in iniquity. He was born from the womb uh, uh, by nature. He was a sinner and his choices uh, uh, affected his life. Plus, you know, Titus too, I mean, makes it so clear. Um, And that's not to minimize any woman. It's not to elevate any man, as as you both said. Um, It 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 just has to do with the design of God um, that he made us complementary. We call it complementarianism. Uh, he made us to complement one another. A man is to lead, a woman is to be his helpmate. That doesn't make the man greater. It doesn't make the woman better. It goes back to the design and the function that God made. And that was pre-fall. <laughs> we often forget that. This is pre-fall that we're talking about. Genesis 1 and 2, pre-fall, God made the design. Um, and you see that over and over again in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. I mean, on and on and on about you know, how a husband and wife are to lead. And by the way, that doesn't mean that one thing, big thing 
is mutual submission. What we mean is that a husband and a wife are joined together. They're joint heirs with Christ. The one isn't better than the other just because one is leading and the other is following. They're not better or greater than one another. They're both united to Christ and they're both to mutually submit. Yes, the man is to lead, but they're mutually to submit to Christ. The husband is to lead because of Christ, not you know, just as an authoritarian figure and in an abusive way. That's, that's a really important thing that just to bring that out in this discussion. You're, you might be listening and watching this. This is a lot to, there's a lot here. There's a lot more to say, you know, about Greg Locke, about all these men that, that follow in his wake and, and many more, really. The reason that we're doing this is, isn't, isn't to, is, is to say this. It's to say, that it matters that we that we point out when people make statements from about the Bible. It's important that we engage them with the Bible. Um, the goal here is both to educate, but it's also to warn. Um, and the Bible has something to say about both. We we educate those who may not be aware, to so that they might contend for the faith. Uh, Jude three, First uh, Peter three fifteen. But we also warn people to not follow their ministry. So we don't want you to go watch their videos. We don't want you to consume their content uh, because they're not engaging in a biblical way. We want you to we want you to be instructed. We want you to be discerning. Uh, First Thessalonians five twenty one says to test all things and to hold fast to what is good. We want you to be like the Marines in Acts seventeen eleven. Search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And as you do, I think what you're going to find is, as we've stated multiple all three of us have stated you're going to find that that the ministry that they're offering you is not a ministry that jesus authorized us to instead what they're offering is a ministry of control and manipulation and spiritual abuse that's not the ministry of jesus he began that seven keys teaching starting with luke 4 with jesus quoting from isaiah 61 but that's not the what jesus's point there wasn't something about delivering people from a demon, his his greater goal was something greater. The very reason for the incarnation was that Christ would come and die under the sentence of death to pay for our sins in our, in our place and for our sins and to be buried and to rise again. But what I think what Locke is offering is the opposite of that. He's offering people not freedom from their sins, but freedom from their demons, freedom to have their experiences um, and to be then set free from them, not freedom that Christ and the apostles preached, you know, that was ultimately the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, you know, that Christ would crush the serpent's head, which Jesus did. Um, and so it's just, it's just the total opposite. And you have to pay attention in these types of things to emphasis, emphasis. What's the emphasis of the person What's the emphasis of their message? What's the content of their message? How's they delivering that message? All of those things matter biblically. You just go read, if you want to go read the book of Acts and just notice how the apostles following Jesus, how they ministered. And it is going to become so obvious. That's not how the apostles ministered. And that's not how Jesus ministered. What are your guys' last thoughts? Well, the scariest verses in the Bible are when Jesus says to people who came to him and said, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Jesus said, away from me, you workers of inequity, I never knew you. And that points to casting out demons in Jesus' name. You might be following a false Christ is a very high likelihood. And I certainly was in the new age when I was casting out these earthbound spirits and, and thought I was following Jesus. It was a false Christ. So be very careful with this. Your eternity is potentially at stake. I think the thing that's been most encouraging to me in coming out of this in the last several years is realizing that the gospel is sufficient. I think that's one of the biggest things that's severely lacking in in these types of movements in the modern deliverance movement. Um, even though they will mention, they say they mention the gospel, I would just like to hear any of them present the gospel in accordance with scripture. Um, because the gospel is sufficient and it's sufficient to save. It's sufficient to deliver people. We're not promised complete healing on this side of heaven. We're not promised that we're not going to deal with, with some sort of um, oppression or any sort of outward attacks of the enemy. But the good news that Christ gives us is that we haven't been left 
hopeless. And and that's the thing that I that is most encouraging is that even in times in difficulties in life that that I know I face and others face is that when we place when we know that our trust our trust and our hope is in Christ and that we stay in his word and that we're our minds are renewed by his word and that the Holy Spirit is helping us to understand his word and have it written on our hearts so that we can, in those times that are difficult that we can recall, call to remembrance his word and it encourages us and it strengthens us and it puts our focus back on Christ. Um, unfortunately, in these movements, the focus is on self or it's on demons. And it's that's not a Christ-centered gospel. When the demons are the focus or you're the focus, that's not, Christ is not the focus. He's on, he's on the outside of everything, on the periphery. And that's what I would just encourage those that want to hold on to that is, you need to understand the gospel is sufficient. What Christ did on the cross is sufficient. There's hope in there. There's good news in there. It doesn't mean you're going to walk in victory all the time like you think victory is, but you have victory because Christ has defeated Satan. He's a defeated foe and he's not afraid of us. The devil doesn't fear us. He fears God. And that that should encourage us um, and, and to help us to remember to keep our eyes on Christ. Amen.